Boom. And we are live here with the Meat Mafia podcast, uh, joined by my co-host, Mr. Salazzo, and our amazing guest, the sugar-free man, Mike Collins. How's everyone doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> we love Not it. here in the love world. It. Oh, we love the, uh, the little sign you got in the back, too, and the red. Looks like you got some red lights back there, the sugar-free man. Yeah, it's my little neon. It's like, uh, I saw these guys that, uh, you may know the guy, Ben is out, you know, Ben, he's, uh, so. he's a keep conscious or what is he? Uh, I don't know. Keto camp with a K. Okay. And, uh, he had some neon stuff and I was jealous. I got it. I like those signs. It's good. That's a good branding right there. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're excited to talk to you, man. And we appreciate you making the time. We think that the, our audience based on a lot of the feedback we've been getting, we've been got, getting a lot of questions on just food addiction and sugar addiction. Yeah. And you really are one of the leading forefront experts in the sugar addiction space. I know that um, I think that there's, there's three websites that you've personally built, right? I was looking It's there's sugaraddiction.com, sugardetox.com, and then quit sugarsummit.com, which are all yours. Yeah. And we also know you wrote the Amazon bestseller, The Last Resort Sugar Detox. So I think to as a starting point, Mike, I think we'd love to just learn a little bit more about your own nutritional journey and really what led you down this path towards wanting to understand sugar addiction and the role that it plays in Western society. Yeah, thanks. No, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's uh, You guys are the first group that I've ever met from Twitter. So that's cool. Yeah. Love it. Um, Love it. That's awesome. I, we were talking before we came on and I was just starting to get more involved there. Um, and I, I really, I'm enjoying it. At first I thought Twitter was like the professionals talking to the professionals, but now I'm kind of finding out that there's a lot of people that are paying attention over there, you know? So anyway, I do have, I do have the podcast version of my life story, if you will. And it's, it's kind of, it's not, you know, it's encapsulated and it usually brings up more questions than it answers, which would be perfect for our discussion. But um, it really started a generation ago or two generations ago, really. Um, you know, my grandmother, my mother's mom died when she was only eight years old. And so it was terrible. I mean, she was only eight and she had to move in with her aunt. Um, uh, and it was, you know, her, her, her father, my grandfather, and then moved in with my great aunt, her aunt. And they owned the country store across the way. And anytime that eight-year-old girl walked across the street, my, my grandfather made a deal with her, his cousin who owned the store, that she could have any candy she wanted for free. And, you know, it was logical when she had just died. But that went on. And my mom really believed that sugar was love. She really believed that sugar in all its forms was a way to express love for kids, for anyone, baking, you know, all that kind of thing. And so I grew up that way and we were just covered up with sugar. I mean, literally we could have unfettered access to the sugar bowl. We could put as much on our cornflakes or Cheerios or whatever, scrape off half an inch at the bottom. And I just didn't realize that and I don't think anyone realizes in this society what that did and what that is now, now that the science is out, right? And so, you know, fast forward, and I just thought I had a regular childhood, um, and I ran into beer <laughs> at 14 or 15, and that, now this is going to be an important part of the whole conversation, I knew that beer changed my state, right? I knew it changed how I felt. It's kind of a shy kid. And I could drink behind the high school and talk to girls at the dance, right? So liquid courage, the whole thing. Well, anyway, that party lasted till I was 28 years old and I got sober. Now that's in another complete podcast, but I, you know, I'm an open book. I'll answer any questions on that too. And so when I got sober, I started to realize that, you know, I was literally like all of my fellows around recovery in general was falling back to, you know, sugar, flour, uh, caffeine, nicotine. Now I didn't smoke or drink much, much coffee, but I would drink Mountain Dew, which was the high, it was at the time before power, before energy drinks, the most caffeinated beverage on the market. So I'm drinking straight sugar, 16 ounce Mountain Dew, six or eight a day, right? Never without one, right? 
And so I started, the caffeine started to bother me. It, it gave, I knew it gave me anxiety. So I quit the caffeine and then I'm still drinking Sprite, right? And I'm eating pasta and I'm eating pizza and I'm eating just crap, right? And I'm a kind of a thin athletic guy and I had gained like 20 pounds just like that. You know, my face is all red from rosacea, worse than when I drank, okay? And so it was just like, um, I read this book at that time called Sugar Blues. I started to kind of study it and got lucky really to have a guy that I was working out with who was, you know, a weightlifter and he was cutting weight, right? He understood the concept of eating a lot of carbs, gaining a lot of weight, cutting it back down, right? But he didn't do that. He was not like his buddies in the gym. He never carb loaded. And so I kind of understood at that point, or he understood. So I got a, had one person to talk to. Nobody in recovery wanted to talk about this. No one wanted to listen to this. They didn't have, you know, they used to say, Mike, are you sober today? And I'm like, yeah, so don't worry about the damn sugar, right? And so they just, you know, they didn't think about it. Anyway, I went on to marry a woman um, and we had two kids, twins they were. And uh, somehow I talked her into having children, no sugar, no flour, no caffeine. She, she quit smoking before that. So she had nothing when they were pregnant and until uh, and, they were six years old. We, we, you know, we were at a birthday party and they ended up having some. But after that, about once a month for the rest of their childhood. And I could brag on that story forever. My kids are about your guys' age. And to tell the story of their life would blow your mind mm -hmm. mentally because they genuinely, I believe with all my heart, that first thousand days, their brain developed. Their mm -hmm. brain developed better than the average fetus, if you will. And, you know, again, this is, there's a lot of science about this now. But there wasn't back then. This was more an intuitive thing and whatever. Anyway, I went on and had a regular business career and a life and stuff. And the, um, the kids always said I should write a book about sugar. So I did that in 2018. And it's on Amazon, as you mentioned. But the, um, it wasn't until about five or six. I, I opened the site in the first site, Sugar Addiction, about 12, 13 years ago. And I gave out the best information on the planet, but really nothing took for anyone. No one really got the information until about five or six years ago. I was kind of semi-retired and I, um, I started forming these groups and I started coaching. And when I was coaching, uh, I farted, finally figured out the secret formula and how people can actually quit, right? And that was the group dynamic of it all. Anyway, what's more relevant probably for your guys' podcast is during that process of between when the kids were born, actually right around when the kids were born, uh, when I was starting to change my diet, I have cycled through damn near every diet on the planet. Now, obviously, I wasn't eating any carbs or sugar or caffeine or anything like that, but I was vegetarian, uh, macrobiotic. Uh, raw food vegan at one point, um, and then, you know, pescatarian, the state fish, and literally about three or four years ago, no, it's probably five or six years ago now, a woman who I respect a lot, um, we, we were talking about, I was the president of the F uh, Food Addiction Institute, and we were talking about uh, fruit, grains, um, fruit and grains mostly, right? And she said she hadn't had fruit or grains in 20 years. I'm like, 20 years? I'm like, and so I started to, re and I was, I was starting to get, um, at that time, this is like I said, five or six years ago, I had been pretty healthy all this time on this kind of, you know, kind of a cheating vegetarian diet, whatever, call it that. Uh, I would do fish and what have you. But I was also getting acne in my 50s. My gums had bled since I was a teenager. They never stopped bleeding, even through all this, right? Um, I, you know, I was literally getting these little cognitive declines. Like I would, like, wasn't, my brain was like short-term memory problems. And both my parents had died of Alzheimer's, right? And so I quit, I said, all right, I'll try anything. So I quit the grains. I quit the fruit. Um and I, you know, I at that time added more meat into my diet, more steak and, and like that. 
literally those things went away just like that. I mean, 30, 60 days, that stuff went away. Um, I really believe it cured adult ADD. And, you know, four or five years ago, my ability to focus came back. Mm. And so as far as, you know, like your guys uh, podcast and yourself, I would hope that you guys ask me questions about the addiction piece of the puzzle. And I'll end it with this story of a guy who used to be, um, uh, he needed, he'd lost a hundred pounds on keto, right? And he came to me and he's, he couldn't get off the peanut M&Ms. He just couldn't get off the peanut M&Ms. He, 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 and he was not willing to accept the idea of an addiction, the sugar addiction. He still had 60 pounds to lose, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy, like he, we, we, we started working together in a coaching way, right? And he was, you know, every time he realized that he was using these peanut M&Ms, he had had a dust up with this woman. He had a relationship for 12 years. And we started to tie the two things together, his emotional state and what he was using to process these emotions and the peanut M&Ms, right? Mm. Well, when we got through that, the 60 pounds are gone, the woman's gone, and so are the peanut M&Ms, you know what I mean? And so, and he got through the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's, like I said, brings up usually more questions than it answers, but that's the short version of how I got here. And, you know, um, well, happy to answer any questions about it. I'm curious on that last piece, Mike. So the connection there is the emotional, uh, an emotional piece tied to something that's somewhat addictive, whether it's sugar in the M&M form, nicotine, coffee. Is that something that you have done more research on or have any, um, you know, personal anecdotes that you can kind of unpack there where it's like, what, what's the real, what's the real connection there? Well, you know, it's probably the most important question you're going to ask of the whole presentation, you know, the whole podcast, because this is the, this is my work. What you're describing is my, is the work. And this is the, it is a very well-known and common construct in the world of alcohol and drug recovery. And just before I say that, the, the reason we're successful is because I have poured it over constructs from the, my alcohol and drug recovery, my substance use disorder recovery to the world of food addiction and sugar addiction, peer recovery and harm reduction, okay? And the, the common construct in the world of uh, drugs and alcohol is that if you started using drugs and alcohol when you were 14 or 15, you stopped growing emotionally. Your life's a mess, your relationships are a mess, your finances are a mess, your career's a mess. Um, you just didn't grow up, you know, because you, instead of handling your problems, you got high at four o'clock and say, well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Well, no, tomorrow never came and you never handled any of your, your responsible life, emotional problems. And so you have a stunted emotional life, literally. And that's a very well-known and common construct. What is less known or less understood is this idea that, that sugar and flour and caffeine in my world uh, people get on me with the caffeine because a lot of carnivores that do a lot of caffeine, but they're wrong. Anyway, this idea that, you know, you can't be stunted by these drugs, quote unquote. And the idea, if you've ever talked to a woman or anyone who's lost uh, 200 pounds, fall into a right size body, they do not talk about their diet. They don't talk about the food. They talk about their emotional recovery. Mm. Now think about it, extrapolate it backwards when you're looking at this situation where um, they didn't start using drugs and alcohol at 14 or 15. They started using sugar and flour in the womb probably. And then from as a baby, you're using sugar and flour. So think about what when you surface at 40 or 50 years old or whatever, and now you've got to rejigger your entire, the way that you handle day-to-day -day stress. And one of the things that's the most prominent in what's going on in my work, and this is documented left, right, and center all over the internet, is that the old trauma that people are experiencing that they never processed is being covered up with sugar and flour and weight and everything. And when you let go of it, this trauma starts to, this starts to process itself out of the body. Mm -hmm. I always recommend this book, the, the Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. uh, 
when I started recommending, it had about 15,000 reviews. Today, it has 45,000 reviews on Amazon. Wow. And it's a very, very in-depth description of how this all works, right? Which almost no one is willing to read, but because uh, it's kind of not it's not really sciencey. The guy tells pretty good stories, but it's a construct that if people are willing to accept it, a the construct of addiction or this idea that that these substances affect your emotional life, then they can get to the other side. If they don't, they're going to be on that same roller coaster for the rest of their life. Hmm. And I know that's. I, I, I don't know what it sounds like, but I'm tired of not hiding behind what is really the truth. That's the truth, you know. Do you, so. do, you do you think that it's a binary uh, lifestyle where you're either addicted to something or you're you're clean? Like, so a lot of people will have great health, great health habits, but they have their one or two vices. Um, is it something that is that binary where you think that even people who are having the cup of coffee in the morning are still struggling with some sort of suppressed emotional crutch, if, if that's the right way to say it? I do at some level, yes. And here's why. In the last five years, the research around dopamine and the brain re chemical reward systems has exploded. I mean, literally exploded. Okay. Okay. And the last Quit Sugar Summit that we had was the Brain Summit, okay? David Perlmutter, Bresden, Chris Palmer from Harvard. We had all of the biggest of the big, right? And we would delve into this in, in such detail where Bresden, I mean, he's got a book of 13 survivors of Alzheimer's, quote unquote, an incurable disease, right? Incurable um, brain den uh, denigration disease, right? Well, these people were lawyers, doctors, therapists, college professors that wrote the, their own story in the book where they would decline in brain power, had to quit their jobs, some of them, and then were able to come back and recover um, by these, the diet that you guys proffer and that I uh, adhere to. Because the brain chemicals, the dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, is so affected by these substances that they, you know, they're just not, you know, people aren't living the life that they could be living, you know, and, and so, and again, this was all anecdotal for most of my life and most of everyone's life, but in the last five years, the science has exploded that the frontal lobe, the, the, the nucleus accumbens, the thing that is powering our, 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 our uh, intellect and our brain reward chemicals is being decimated by these drugs. It, it's mm -hmm. just being decimated by these uh, psychoactive drugs. And people don't like it when I call sugar, flour, and caffeine psychoactive drugs, but that's indeed what they are, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you find that even to be true with natural sugar as well? Because that seems like that's a pretty contentious debate on Twitter is it seems like there's a group of people that are in the lower car paleo space that will eat fruit. And they're also a group of people that just try and stay away from all sugars as well. Where, where, what is your take on that? <laughs> Boom, he's trying to get me in trouble. He's trying to stir up some controversy. Okay, so here's, a, here's the story. Here's the video. Gary Fetke, Dr. Gary Fetke, F-E-T-K-K-E -E, on YouTube, Is Fruit Good For Me? Which will be a 30-minute explanation what I'm going to give you in five. So, and Richard Johnson's new book, oh, I wish I had it. I think it's in my other room. Uh, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. It was also on the Quit Sugar Summit last time, in the Brain Summit because he has done insane research on fructose. Now, for your audience, the, the table sugar, sugar molecule is half fructose and half glucose, right? Everybody on Twitter, everybody, everybody was worried about the glucose and the diabetes and the this and the that. 
the heart disease and the weight and all this other stuff. But the reason they can't quit the stuff, like if I told you to stop eating steak for a month, you'd do it. You know, I, I like steak. It's part of my diet. But you would be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Broccoli, if you're vegetarian, same thing. But try and get somebody to just quit sugar for a month. Just no sugar. That's it. No fruit, whatever. They can't do it. And they can't do it because of fructoses. Uh, I'm blanking for words here. Fructose's effect on the on the brain. Fructose's effect on the brain, right? And Dr. Johnson's research will prove to you and prove to them that animals develop this foraging thing. Like a bear will eat forty thousand blueberries and literally go. Dr. Um, what's his name from Cornell? Uh, I forget his name now. Anyway. It'll come to you. Cantley, Richard Cantley. It'll literally go into a diabetic coma for like the entirety of the, the winter because of this amount of fructose they ate. And this is engineered into all of us, right? Well, think about it. Just think about it for a minute. We were supposed to eat fructose once or twice a year and possibly a little bit, if you're willing to get stung by a bee, a little bit of a taste of it, right? Today, currently, we use fructose 24-7, 365, all the time, high fructose corn syrup. Now, this is processed fructose. The difference between processed caffeine and processed, um, excuse me, processed cocaine and, and, and not processed cap, you know, cocaine is the coca leaf is really just like a little caffeine buzz if you chew it. But if you process it down to a white powder, it becomes cocaine, right? Process it further into crack, it becomes crack, okay? And it's more powerful. But sugar, fructose, not glucose, is the part that affects the nucleus accumbens and the reason you can't quit because you are addicted to the dopamine, serotonin. What I like to tell people is you don't want a sweet treat. You want a dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. You're looking for your body to do what it was evolved to do for 7 million years in the approach of sex and food by sitting on the couch, you're able to just get the dopamine hit from the substance, right? Why would you want to do an effort based, write that one down, effort based dopamine production of work, of walking, of a hug, of exercise, of yoga, of watching a sunset, of preparing a meal, uh, you know, calling a friend where you would get dopamine when you can just sit on the couch and, and have that feeling that evolution has given us over 7 million years by just ingesting a substance, right? You're, you're playing with your brain chemicals with fructose, okay? And so the answer to the question is, is as I said, Dr. Fecky can do it much better than I can, is that we are not supposed to eat fructose in those in the quantity that we are that we have been and it is affecting not so i mean and also fructose is processed very differently than glucose it's only can be pro mostly only some of it can be processed in the intestines but most of it can only be processed in the liver and fructose causes fatty liver disease. We have an epidemic of five-year-olds with fatty liver and fatty liver is an alcoholic's disease, right? And so the answer to your question, if you wanna understand everything that I'm talking about and everything that's going on is don't study sugar, don't study glucose or your uh, A1C or anything, and study addiction and study fructose. These are the things that keep you on the processed stuff. These are the reasons you can't quit. So, sorry, I, I get a little testy about the fructose part because it's such a, it's so exciting to me, honestly exciting that the answer to why the obesity crisis, why everything is going on is literally the answer is in the fructose. And people mm. call it fructose too, so either way. Mike, when you said the dopamine hit, that made me start thinking about other types of lifestyle addictions that people have, whether it be 
you know, scrolling their phone or pornography, I think is one that's grown without anyone really calling it out and talking about it. Um, just as another thing that's just like, um, a lifestyle addiction that people kind of rely on. And, um, as you said, there's so many other ways to get that dopamine hit through natural, uh, more, more wholesome ways, but it's like, uh, people just choose to do the, the easiest, uh, the easiest thing. I'm curious, do you, do you group those all in together? Like is nutrition kind of more of like, uh, the bedrock of the hierarchy, if you were to create like a hierarchy of addiction, uh, just start with nutrition and then go to things that other things that people, um, are addicted to? Um, that, that's a good question. It's a really good question, actually. Um, in that, uh, there's a, there's a, company here in Los Angeles, they've changed their name since, but you can still look them up by this called dopamine labs mm. and dopamine labs. Their job is to make apps sticky. Like, and even they even work with the uh, gambling, like slot machines and stuff, you know? And so, yes, absolutely. I, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm going to have to make a decision here. I, I don't think there is a hierarchy. Genuinely, yeah. I think an addiction is an addiction is an addiction. Right. And some people can go like I've had the extreme, like 500 pounds overweight, losing limbs, going blind. Uh, it, you know, they, they the doctor says you'll be dead this year if you don't quit. And they still can't quit. Right. They still have to ingest sugar. So I've had the extremes of the sugar. And I'm sure you guys know people that are severely addicted to their phone. And definitely a lot of people would severely addicted to other process addictions, you know, sex, you know, they'll do stupid things, ruin their work life and their family life and their marriage and stuff over their addiction to sex or gambling or something. Mm -hmm. And so there are, I think maybe the answer is there is a spectrum by which like uh, it affects you, you mm. know, how much you want to use the certain dopamine producer you know the thing that's going to get the hit and some people go way down the rabbit hole of sex some gambling some substances uh, marijuana or or alcohol or whatever some people are just big drinkers and you know that's their addiction and everything else in their life seems to be working so i think the spectrum is really how much you're using of the product you know or or which one and you can have multiple obviously you can have two or three but I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's all relative. It's all relative to the amount of dopamine you're getting producing, or or what you know what what you kind of like. What's your thing, you know? Right. And a lot of to like how you were brought up. If your father was a gambler, or you know your father uh, was a drinker, or whatever, mother, you know that you know it's it's it, they say like addiction is inherited, but it's not really. I don't think addiction is inherited. I think the family value systems are in here. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. one of the things I use to get people in the program is I just say, tell me about your parents. <laughs> and then they tell me about diabetes, Alzheimer's, you know, all this stuff, overweight. And that's really all I got to say, you know, because yeah. they can see themselves in the future. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, Mike, is that there, there is this, this crop of addictions, like you mentioned, drugs, alcohol, gambling, pornography, et cetera that I feel like are commonly labeled as, you know, true, true addictions, they're legitimate. Whereas like we can probably have a really deep conversation about how legitimate food addiction actually is, but it seems like there's this crop of people out there that are, that, that say, you know, Hey, why don't you just have the willpower to hold off on food? It seems like for whatever reason, there's this group of people that doesn't let food addiction or sugar addiction be bucketed to be just as legitimate as alcohol or drugs or gambling. Is yeah. that something that you see as well? And do you have, how do you feel about that? Because we do see that a lot on Twitter with people that respond to us. No, that's a, you know, very perceptive. And uh, what do you call it? Uh, you're paying attention in that. I, like I said, I used to be the chairman of the board of the Food Addiction Institute, right? Its stated goal is to get it in to the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual of uh, diseases, mental stuff that you can, so that you can bill for insurance, right? It's currently not in there. Sugar addiction is not in there, right? Um, food addiction is not in there. Processed food addiction, none of that stuff is in that manual. 
you can't really, there's no, you, you've got to really fudge the paperwork in order to get somebody into a treatment center for this kind of stuff, right? But I've also, for the last two decades or three decades, of well, solid one decade of my life, run with all of the people who work in the food addiction space. And I guarantee that it will be in the DSM if it's not this next version, the version after that. Gambling's in there, right? I think even gaming got in there or is being nominated or something. So they're understanding different addictions and, and you know, um, science is moving forward to do that. And I'll tell you an anecdote that's pretty interesting that, you know, they have these low carb conferences and this kind of stuff. And um, so until addiction folks like myself started speaking on the stages of the low carb conferences and the carnivore conferences, they paid no attention to this topic that you're bringing great light to, and I appreciate it, in the addiction part of it. And now you don't see any low-carb conferences or carnivore con or keto car conferences without it, one or two people talking about addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're starting. I've always found keto people very sciencey, as mm -hmm. opposed to vegetarians who are semi, like almost religious in their, fu their fury or their fever of, you know, it's more of a, and Dr. Fecky and his wife, Belinda, talk a lot about the evolution of uh, vegetarianism as literally, a, I, I, I would stop short of calling it a cult, but it is an evolution of um, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists who were uh, in, uh, huge in starting the um, Dietitians Association in America, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a great story. I'm really a really a good story. But anyway, you know, the answer to the question is that um, uh, it's not accepted knowledge yet, really. It's, it's still in its infancy. It's like seatbelts in cars, smoking and smoking in public, um, condoms in bathrooms. Science has now caught up to this and it's going to take a while for society to change and understand all this. Um, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, the tobacco litigation, these were things that helped move those other things, seatbelts and smoking, into the public awareness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sugar addiction, processed food addiction, flour addiction, you know, addiction in the food realm is in its infancy in people's understanding. I think that's the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting because you you combine the fact that evolutionarily we have this preference to get foods that are as calorically dense as possible with the least amount of effort and energy as possible for us to be able to conserve our own energy. Right. And then you couple that with the fact that now you walk around a grocery store, there's anywhere from 33,000 to 47,000 products you go to a gas station, you're loaded with the same types of products. It's literally, it's all over the, it's so prevalent that willpower is only going to take you to a certain, ex, to a certain level where if you don't have a legitimate system, we talk about that all the time, you're going to succumb to it. Like even someone like me that has ulcerative colitis, that's done really well on a carnivore and animal-based diet. If someone puts a bag of Doritos or Cheetos in my face, I will literally crush the entire bag knowing how terrible it is for me. And it's like, Harry's laughing. And I laugh about it too, but it's like, that's how addictive this crap actually is. So I personally seen it all the time and I'm sure you see it with a ton of your patients. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's a real recovery guys. It's like, if you got heart disease or cancer or something, uh, and then you, it went into remission or you had a heart bypass or something, um, you wouldn't just, that wouldn't be the end of it you'd have a cancer screen once a year for the rest of your life and yeah. they follow up on you and you'd have your heart checked. You'd go see the doctor once a life, twice a year, three times a year for the rest of your life yeah. and recovery or change in this, you know, I think the big problem is people look at this diet as, you know, you can uh, lose the weight, go back to where you were. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. You have to change your lifestyle you have to accept something, you know, we're tribe animals, right, guys? And it's like, we don't want to be outside the tribe. If you were outside the tribe a thousand years ago, you could die, literally die. You know, something could happen to you. And we don't want to be outside the tribe. Well, currently, 99.9% .9 of the population, 99% of the population 
ingests a lot of flour sugar in, in every birth, death, celebration, marriage, everything. It's part of the it's part of the culture, and it's part of what everybody does. And they don't realize that the science has has changed the game a little bit. It's mm. defining why. I almost say why we're getting old because I personally believe like I, I vary on the numbers, but 70 to 80, 85% of all maladies, mental and physical are caused by flour, sugar, and caffeine period. It's like, there was a lady who just recently passed away. We dedicated one of our summits to it, Nancy Appleton. And she wrote a bunch of books during the way before all this science came out. And she had a list of 143 maladies that sugar was involved with, with scientific backup. And so I, I, you know, we've, I've seen everything clear almost. I mean, type two diabetes is a literal paper tiger. I mean, it's just like no flour, no sugar, no caffeine, no, no diabetes, no, no pre-diabetes. It goes into remission. Verta Health, $2 billion valuation just from diet change, no medicine, nothing, just diet change, you know, and it just keeps happening. It's just that it's not of the public awareness. They're still in the cult or the tribe that is evolved over 300 years since the slaves landed here in America and started processing the sugar. And that's going to take a lot. It's a big battleship to turn and they don't turn on the dime, you know, so it's going to take time for that whole thing to happen. But the science is there and the proof is there in the people that, I mean, lupus, forget about rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is just simply sugar addiction, in my view. You know what I mean? Almost everybody within a month, their hands feel better, their knees just happened to the other day for the second or third time. A woman had one knee operation, had the other one scheduled, got off of sugar for three or two or three months canceled the, the next knee, not going to get the knee operation. Right. And so it's, you know, and now the most exciting part is the mental part of this, mm. the mental, um, bipolar schizophrenia, depression. I mean, headaches, migraines, all of this stuff clears. If anyone has the courage to try 100% abstinence for 90 days. If they can try one, 90 days, no abs, no sugar, no flour, we will gladly refund all of their physical and mental ailments. You know, when you go to the doctor and you do a scratch test, what that is, where they do the grass and pollen and dust. Right. And stuff. Yeah. So here's the scratch test, no flour, no sugar, no caffeine. Yeah, it's hard in the first 20, 30 days for 90 days, almost no one, zero, approaching zero people that I've ever worked with ever wanted to go back. They, they just didn't. They just, they, yes, they slipped occasionally in the first year or something, but they had changed their lifestyle because their skin was better. They were falling. Here's the most amazing part of this entire discussion is 95% of the people come in to see me for weight loss. Mm -hmm. they, they're overweight or they're pre-diabetic or something. But when I do the surveys of people after they're like six months into this thing and they maintain an absence of flour, sugar, and caffeine, those folks all, that's like second or third, sometimes even more. The number one thing that they are excited about is their brain has come back online. They're able to process better. They're able to think better. They're able to focus better. Their memory is 100% better. It's just they're able to do their job better. They're not as irritable and angry with their kids or their spouse. It's their brain that this drug is affecting the most, right? And the weight will just happen. It'll just happen. So anyway, I get on a soapbox occasionally, guys. I don't mean to, but yeah. Well, well it's... It's an amazing, amazingly powerful message. I think that I'd be curious to hear how you would set up this, you know, obviously you, you have your, your websites, your book, your program, but like if you were setting someone up to start breaking an addiction, what are the one or two key principles or 
philosophies that you stand behind to help them get there? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's weird because you got Dr. Google out there, right? And it seems like, every, I mean, everybody and their brother has got a sugar detox bolted on to their uh, keto program or their vegetarian program or whatever. They've all, even, I mean, Good Housekeeping has one. Uh, hell, TMZ has one. Uh, they Everybody has a sugar detox, right? But their belief is that they, it, the one and done, like a diet, like they can lose 20, 10 pounds and then go back to normal or go back to what the what they were doing before. They can detox and go back. Well, what I'm here to tell you is that if we have three different groups, okay, normies, people who can eat half a brownie and leave the other half, you're like, what the hell? How did they? Do that? You know, the, yeah. you know, or they could have one or two of those. They could have one or two of those Doritos and just leave the bag. And you're like, how the hell did they do? That? And then the, the second group is harmful users, and harmful users are people who have because they're 75 percent of the food products in the grocery store have sugar in them, and they've adapted kind of an addiction to it. They've they've kind of grown accustomed to using it for stress relief and stuff. But once they reset, those folks can go back to some normal use, meaning they can have it at their birthday or, you know, and it's not a problem. And then there's stone cold addicts. OK, that's and the crazy part is this. These numbers gel with the obesity numbers, a third obese, a third overweight. Those are harmful users and a third normal weight. Now, I want to clarify, you can be a stone cold sugar addict and be normal weight. We've got a lot of ultra marathoners. I have an Olympic mm -hmm. athlete one placed in the olympics okay and she was just, and she would admit it she's a chiropractor now but she would admit that she was a stone cold sugar and caffeine addict and she was you know had a perfect body still at 40 something years old so you know so what i'm getting at here is that the sugar the 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 the, the, the you know the, the addictive process if they can understand it if they can grasp it and they can accept it and if they fall in the harmful user range or if they fall in the addictive process range, then they have to do something about it. And that's, it's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I, I don't want to say it's easy, but the answer to your question is the only answer to the question is groups. It's, it's community, it's tribe. And if you do not join a tribe who believes as you do that this has evolved scientifically and anecdotally, and all of the success stories that we have and other people have, if you don't believe that, then, uh, and you don't have a group, because you're going to be the odd man out for a long time here. You're going to be, you know, in your relatives, even in your own family, you know, a lot of women, a lot of people have credibility issues when they get to uh, their 40th diet, or, you know, they say, I'm quitting sugar. And the whole family goes, yeah, sure you are. They're not, they're just not accepting this idea, you know, because they've tried before and failed. And so if you do not, and you don't have to leave your family of origin or your classmates or your workmates, but you do have to join another tribe, at least to get through the first year or two, where people understand what you're going through. Because a lot of times people could be normies in their family, normal, and they say these things like, why don't you just cut back? Why don't you just quit a little? Why do you have to quit completely? When they just don't accept or understand what we've talked about for the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's the, 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 the secret sauce. If you're asking what the secret sauce is, you got Dr. Google for all the information I've given you. You can find it if you dig. But the actual, um, uh, what's that word? Um, experiential, the actual solution to the problem is the group dynamic which exploded for us and for everyone during covid when zoom became such a popular thing um before that was happened usually in person and there's a lot of science around this look the science says if you have a cancer survivor or a heart attack survivor and you join a peer group of cancer survivors or your your chance of success goes exponentially up, mm -hmm. just insanely high. 
um, by joining these groups. And this is all, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, this very well known in the substance use disorder world. And now there's a lot of science, peer reviewed science about it too. So the answer to your question is, it's a community based effort. It has to be because right now we're so isolated because everybody else is using sugar and caffeine and flour and whatever. So. How would you define uh, the community element? What, cause uh, personally, I feel like I have one or two sort of accountability uh, p- people in my life who ho- I think hold me accountable for a lot of things, uh, Brett being one of them. And it's like, with with that small group, I feel like it, it, it does create the positive influences that I need to make the good decisions consistently. Um, is that, do you think that's, a, uh, there's like a, could it just be one other person or does it need to be like a certain size group to really have a powerful effect? Um, sorry, I, I had to pause that. I hope you guys didn't hear that, but the- No, you're good. Slack, oh, no. The Slack thing kept going on and on. <laughs> you're good. Uh, um, I'm sorry, repeat the question. Yeah, so I was just asking, uh, how would you define community? Could it be just one other person? Like, Oh, yeah, I mean- yeah, no, it, it can definitely be a couple of people, you know, a couple of people who you can truly be honest with because it's kind of hard. Look, you know, I'll tell you stories. I mean, these are almost universal stories. People throw stuff in the garbage and then they get it out of the garbage. Like, this is pretty common, like really common. And you can't tell that to everyone. You gotta have someone who gets it, who understands that, you know? Right. And sometimes it's not that difficult and, you know, uh, or it's not that extreme, put it that way. Um, it, it, but it does, you know, this, like I've always known, and you guys probably know this too. And, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with the healthy at every weight stuff. I don't, not enough to talk too much about it because but when you talk to someone who um, has been 100 pounds overweight and, you know, every time you see them, they're eating a salad out, right? And they say to themselves, they say to you, oh, I don't really don't eat that much. <laughs> you know, I don't eat any candy. I don't do it. And then when you see my side of the fence, when you've seen thousands of people go through a groups, you know, we got groups of 13, 14,000 in them, right? You've seen thousands of people go through a groups, anonymous groups where they're, with, they're okay and they build up to the ability to be honest and they tell you the real story behind that story and you know what they're doing. If you don't have people that you feel safe to say those types of things to that, yeah, I tell everybody I eat salads at work and I go home and binge all night, you know what I mean? And if you don't have that ability to tell another, I call it a loving mirror. If you don't have the ability to tell another person what's going on for real in your life, you're you're doomed to fail because we're tribe animals. We need that understanding, that acceptance of our warts and all. We need to be able to see uh, or have someone else see us the way we are and still love us. Not like, um, uh, chastise us or say do give me 20 more push-ups you know that's yeah. not going to solve the problem they, they you have to be able to honestly express your what's going on with you and likely a lot of times it's there's a secret involved a secret gambling a secret whatever you know so yeah i mean that's that's why the group dynamic works and it can be one person or it can be you know, a hundred people or, and it's better to have more than less because sometimes you can't reach the other person. I always tell people to bring their phone to the wedding because you can go in the bathroom and text your buddies, you know, like my family's crazy. And they're like, they've got these cakes and I, I can't. And then you, you're, you're okay. You know, it, you can make it through the wedding. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Mike, something I wanted to ask you, what is your take on artificial sweeteners? Do you view them as a helpful tool or is it really a crutch that's taking you away from the end goal? Because I see this a lot in the low carb community, people that wear CGMs, they'll say, hey, I drank a Coke Zero or I had some aspartame and it doesn't spike my blood sugar at all. What is your take on that that whole situation? He's a rabble rouser, this guy. (laughs) He's trying to get me in trouble. No, look. Uh, the reason I say that is because I literally have to trick people into 
getting involved in this program, these programs, because this is a product they need, but they do not want. They mm -hmm. want cute clothes and golf clubs. They yep. do not want to commit to something like this. And sweeteners, while they sound normal because they don't jack the uh, glucose on the CGM, but they are, and this is Lewis Cantley from Cornell. The lab is named after him. Cantley Lab at Cornell. You know, he said it very succinctly is that, you know, well, first of all, he said, <laughs> sugar causes cancer. I said, can you say that again? Can I get a sound bite? Anyway, he said about the, uh, um, the sweeteners is that when you use the sweetener, like daily or whatever, it's that whole wired together, fired together, right? And so, you know, most things that you have, have a little bit of regular sugar and a little bit of fake sweeteners and blah, 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 blah. it's kind of this, especially like uh, health bars of some kind, right? The erythritol and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when your body gets sweet, tastes sweet, it's looking for the real thing. It's literally looking for the real thing. It sets up and keeps the cravings alive, right? And so that's the problem with the sweeteners. What happens when you give us those 90 days of no sugar, no flour, and you know, is that you, your taste buds readjust within seven to 10 days. And you literally, peppers are gonna taste sweet, carrots are gonna taste sweet, Mac macadamia nuts are gonna taste like candy, right? It's gonna go all the way back to your factory settings, right? This is the way that you, we were supposed to experience the sweetness in our life, the mother's milk, the honey, those nasty little berries or those nasty little crab apples, those were supposed to taste sweet to us, right? But we have fruct we have hybridized fruit for 300 years for what? For fructose, for sweetness. So our body has, has readjusted to this new reality of sweetness, right? And this new reality of sweetness is flat out hurting us especially when you're talking about processed stuff, but even the hybridized fruits, you know, forget about dried fruits, forget about um, uh, seedless oranges, seedless grapes. These things can't propagate in nature. Yeah. These are man-made processed products that are loaded up with fructose. So I just, again, it's so hard. Think about where we were at the beginning of this conversation. If somebody's listening to it, no artificial sweeteners, no sugar, no flour, no caffeine. Who the hell is signing up for this thing, mm -hmm. right? Who is going to think about like right up front, you, you write in a sales letter, a sales page or something, who's going to like get involved in anything like this, right? It's all, that's why I like these types of presentations or podcasts or uh, summits is the arc of the whole story is required for people to understand everything. Because if I just said, you can't eat sugar, flour, you know, and the people always ask this question, do I have to do this for the rest of my life? And I can't answer that question for them, but I can get them a scratch test of 90 days so that they can at least experience the other side, which literally a hundred percent of people have never experienced no flour, no sugar, no caffeine for any period of time since the womb forward. So sweeteners don't necessarily, again, back to the glucose fructose thing, they do not necessarily play with your glucose and, and your sugar and, and your CGM, but they are affecting your brain and your cravings, keeping you on the cravings. You know what I mean? Got it. Got it. Mike, will you allow yourself to have some lower fructose foods like berry, blueberries, strawberries, things like that? Or do you just try and eliminate all of it? So there's no fructose at all in your diet. That's a good question. And I, I can't say that I have, um, I do eat occasionally blueberries and okay. strawberries, but it's a big treat for me. Yeah. It's like having a martini for me. I do catch a little bit of a you know, all's right with the world, which is what I think the fructose was supposed to do. Right. You know? It was supposed to make you like stay there, clean that tree out. You felt good. And then also remember it for next year. Mm -hmm. Right. It, that's what the, the dopamine was supposed to do was supposed to help you 
uh, behaviorally remember where that bush was, where that tree was, where that grove was, so that you would come back next year and, and eat it. And so I have, I haven't been successful, to be honest with you, but I have tried to go zero fructose, but you have to realize that greens have fructose in them now. They're all hybridized from a couple of plants. Fru uh, it's a minute amount. But I found that I can't eat Brussels sprouts because Brussels sprouts, which I loved and used to be a staple, um, have a lot of fructose in it. And I used to eat, you know, a couple pounds of them at a sitting like candy, you know what I mean? And they, they affect me now. Kale has a little bit. Kale doesn't affect me yet. But I would like to honestly do a 100% zero fructose. Uh, Dr. Fecky does that. Actually, one of his websites is nofructose.com. Um, and so... Yeah, it's, uh, it's part of my experiment. So it's a good question. You, uh, you just hit on a word that I, I was curious to, to dig in deeper with you, experiment. And um, what does the self-experimentation process mean to you with, um, you know, breaking these addictions? Because I think a lot of people struggle with self-experimentation, whether it's just because they don't see the benefit of it, or they're addicted and they, they, don't, don't see it at all. But, um, you know, if you want to break something, I, I do feel like kind of taking these self experiments is a great way to, as you say, this, the scratch test, um, see some results and then really unpack everything over time. Um, are, are you a big proponent of the self experimentation? hundred percent. I, I think it's a, a failing of, um, I don't know how it's cultural or family. I don't know that people don't tweak their diet. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not a big fan of, uh, I think that 100% absence needs to happen with alcohol and gambling and hey, hell, you could die with one accidental uh, opioid, you know, you could get the wrong stuff and you could die. But, you know, you're in recovery if you say you're in recovery, right? And so I think this in my world, you know, harm reduction world. Um, and I think if you continue to tweak like i've been i'm still tweaking you know 32 years no flour no sugar no caffeine i'm still tweaking stuff i mean i went full bore from you know no meat at all for almost 30 years uh to damn near carnivore in, in the last five years you know hmm. and so uh, you've got to be able to accept you know i say make it your head your hobby right make it your hobby to research this stuff you know the biggest bs phrase on the planet is listen to your body right because no one does it yeah. no one actually you know i think about these these monks these guys who you know invented meditation and like that and they sit for days and they do that kind of thing but if you're doing the the uh the diet thing over time and you get to see when I ingest this, I get, and there's an arc to it. So what I call accidental ingestations. Okay. So over the last 30 years, I've had um, sugar maybe 10 times. Okay. But only accidentally, the one that stands out the most is a friend of mine's wife um, had this beautiful meal prepared. And I said, what's in the salad dressing? And she says, oh, no sugar, Mike, no sugar. And so I'm bored and eat it up. And I am ripped. I'm like, like I did two lines of cocaine, right? I'm like, or had two martinis. I'm like, whoa, you know, and I'm like talking and like this. And I knew, I said, what else did you put in here? And she said, agave. Well, mm. she didn't know agave was 70% fructose, right? Like high fructose corn syrup. And so I knew it. And now I just enjoy it. I actually, I'm a little introverted. So I, I was real like expressive with all these eight people at this dinner party and they're like mike you never talk so much kind of thing and so i kind of enjoyed it and then I, that night i it started to crash and i was starving just ate a beautiful dinner and i'm starving mm -hmm. then i go to sleep and i'm i sweat okay and this is night sweats are a very common uh, sugar addiction withdrawal symptom you sweat at night so I sweat that night. And then the next day I'm blue, like I had a six pack or a 12 pack. You know what I mean? Like I had a hangover. I'm a little bit blue because I had just pumped 
enough dopamine and serotonin for two days in about an hour, right? And a real healthy uh, dopamine, you know, what happens when you use dopamine or, you know, when you use it by sugar, by manipulating it, your, your, uh, your dopamine receptors get downregulated. They get, they get thinned out. You have less of them. Now there's no proven fact that they actually regenerate, but after you're off it, you're, you're not, you know, they're operating at least at their best, highest thing. But when you ingest again, you get an abnormal flood of dopamine. You feel better because by the time we get to adulthood, the only thing we're doing ingesting sugar is to stop withdrawals. Mm-hmm. We're not getting any buzz anymore. Not when you see the, the uh, ice cream come out at a birthday party for four-year-olds and they go, you know, that's, they're still getting the buzz. But when you're 30 years old, all you're doing is not going into withdrawals when you're ingest re-ingesting, right? So anyway, you know, it's, you know, make it your hobby. This is something, if you study it, if you, and look, addiction is not a fun thing to study, really. I mean, anyway, if I wasn't, you know, an alcoholic, you know, if I didn't have this life circumstances, I wouldn't have signed up for this gig. You know what I mean? But that's what, you know acceptance accepting reality as it is is much better than oh i can have a little cookie i can have you know that's childish that's not adulting in my book you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it seems like the self-experimentation and the accountability itself has been really key to your story and we definitely feel that um mike what's the best way for people to connect with you online if they want to learn more about you and the work that you're doing um Sugaraddiction.com is the main site, always has been. Uh, the Quit Sugar Summit is twice a year, January and September. But if you go now, you can uh, see some of the experts that were on the last one and you can give us your email and we'll, we'll email you when the next one comes up. Um, you know, the book is on Amazon or it's probably best. To, the updated book is on the website, either sugardetox.com or sugaraddiction.com. Um, and I'm sugar free man everywhere. Uh, except Instagram right this minute who didn't like one of the things I was saying. So fingers crossed, say a prayer for me that I get that account back, but they were not happy, you know, and sugar occasionally, you know, like I think someone put uh, one of my VAs put sugar is eight times more um, addictive than cocaine, which is theoretically said in some scientific thing, but some fact checker didn't like it. Anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, sugaraddiction.com, sugardetox.com. God forbid you go against the nutritional narratives of the tech overlords, immediate, immediate sense of <laughs> right, right. So, Hopefully I'll get that account back, but um, but on the other, you know, Pinterest, every, everywhere, sugar-free man. So um yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. It's uh excellent. Well, I think the battle with addiction as it relates to food is such a interesting lens to view. Um, I think everyone kind of has these, these things that they lean on, whether you wanted to call it an addiction or not. And I think that there's a ton of value in everything that we just talked about for the past hour. So just want to thank you for coming on and, and really appreciate the work that you're doing and, and uh, the message that you're spreading. Well, guys, thank you. Look, I, I do a bunch, I used to do more podcasts, but um, very rarely are folks from either uh, the health or fitness world open to discussing these things. So you guys are way ahead of your, way ahead of your peers in that. And I think, like I said about the, uh, keto and carnivore, uh, uh, conventions and such that you're going to, you know, you're going to see that this is going to be a big part of it as the future, as we move forward, because people want to do keto or they want to do a diet and they can't quit the sugar basically. Mm. You guys are way ahead of the game. Appreciate you. Well, we'll have to do this again sometime. And um, you guys both take care. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it. You guys take care. Thanks, Mike.